I am not using Zoom completely correctly. I'm still a little bit of a noob on this, but um, can you everyone see my face? Yep, coming awesome. through loud and clear. Great, wonderful. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Elle Jacobson. I am account executive at Filament Games, and I also am an implementation specialist for our game-based learning program for K-12 schools. I'm Alex Stone, I'm a co-founder and CTO at Filament Games. I'm in charge of our software development practices and our web platform and how uh, we think about integrating with districts, other institutions, and how we serve educators. Great. So today we are going to talk to you a bit about um, why games, why you're here today is obviously to learn about educational games and what they can do for you. We'll talk about the tech behind games and we'll also talk about what you can do to start a program within your own school or district. So Alex, um, as CTO and founder, I'm going to let you handle talking a little bit about Filament Games as an organization. Sure. So Filament Games was founded in 2005 and we started as a spinoff from the University of Wisconsin-Madison's research group uh, focused on games and learning science. Um, so we were really invested in the field of research around how games can be used to uh, either reach learners that are, are not uh, able to either be engaged or uh, understand or extend uh, specific topics, but it also to develop understanding at higher uh, orders of knowledge than typically can be delivered within very stressful uh, 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 class periods in the school day, right? Um, so that's sort of the problem we were really trying to tackle when we set off. We are exclusively focused on uh, learning games and in primarily in formal learning environments so in classrooms that are instructor led so we really respect what teachers and other educators bring to the table in, in guiding learners on their learning paths um, we're not like just your regular game company that's like games are cool so whatever <laughs> they can be used anywhere with no modifications um, we definitely think about what are the specific attributes that our interactives and learning experiences uh, can be um, can be addressed so that when they're used by our customers, that they are useful, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, we have um, so we kind of do two main things at Film like Games right now. We uh, primarily we um, do what. What we're going to talk a lot about today, which is work with K-12 institutions to implement game-based learning curriculums. Um, but then also we work with partners and in research institutions, in government, uh, in grant with granting organizations, and with industry to develop uh, learning solutions for corporate training, for defense, and for um, museums, libraries, and schools. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I'm going to just reiterate what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first part of this presentation is identifying why games are useful learning tools and what games can really measure for your school or district. And then we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of how to actually begin implementing that game-based learning program in your schools. So Alex kind of mentioned a really great thing that starts us off well, which is why games? When you think of games, you often think of uh, interactives that kids are, are sometimes playing when they shouldn't be. Um, a lot of students, when I ask them what they think of when they think of games, are Call of Duty and shooting games, and that's not what Filament does. Uh, Filament makes educational games, educational experiences that students can play that teaches students about complex subject matter. And right now you're viewing a picture of students in a classroom in Verona, Wisconsin, and they are playing a game about engineering design. This is a game that isn't something flat or uh, 
multiple choice. This is a game that allows students to get in and understand and manipulate complex systems. And that's important to note because educational games are quite different from games that can be considered quiz games or games that can be considered commercial games. Educational games in particular are created for the classroom, they're usually objective driven, and they allow students to change things within the game that directly correspond with what they're trying to learn. In contrast, you, you've probably seen quiz games, games that allow students to pick uh, a binary choice, you know, true or false, um, pick something that's either right or wrong. And oftentimes, this game doesn't really correspond with what students might be trying to learn. The content is rather flat, so think of uh, a game where you have to add a number of ice cream scoops to a cone, and if you do it correctly, then it's you get a windscreen, and it's supposed to be teaching counting, but you don't really understand why you're doing the counting. In comparison, educational games allow students to dive into things that are considered complex, so um, actually working body systems, or uh, discovering uh, the anatomy or the human body and going inside and understanding why different organs and systems do what they do. The other side of the spectrum is commercial games. And while commercial games actually, I believe, have a lot more in common with educational games, they're still considered a little bit different. Commercial games are primarily played at home. Uh, a great example is Civilization. Maybe you've heard of that game, SimCity. And those games are large. Any learning that happens is usually in incidental. It's not to say that there isn't learning that happens in those games, but it wasn't designed to teach something. And they were more so designed for the entertainment factor. So when we're talking to you about games today, we're talking about that happy medium in the middle that still is rather unique. And that is teaching those cons complex concepts that really allow students to manipulate outcomes so that they're learning something that might be considered difficult. Games here at Filament are designed specifically with learning in mind. So we don't take a look at a concept that you know, we're creating and say, okay, what would be the most fun? What would be the easiest? Instead, we design these games specifically with a learning outcome in mind. I've mentioned the engineering game, I've mentioned body systems, and um, I think that there are other great examples on the Filament website if you're interested. Um, another example that I haven't mentioned would be our game Reach for the Sun, where you're actually growing a flower and understanding the systems. This isn't rewarding you for growing the flower by selecting a multiple choice answer. This is rewarding you because you're actually manipulating the system of the plant. Games make a really big difference, and that's why we continue to do what we, we do here. Um, studies actually show that games, when they are paired with curriculum, can really boost student achievement outcomes. Um, so that's to say that games shouldn't necessarily be the be-all, end-all, and, and we know that here. And that's why we pair curriculum with each of our games. But games, contrary to what parents may say or teachers maybe who haven't used games, uh, games are very beneficial for students when used in the right way. I mentioned curriculum before and I want to mention it again because it's so important. Curriculum not only uh, grounds the student in what they're learning when they are using a game, um, but it allows the teacher to take control back of the classroom and supply that uh, platform for reinforcement. So students are not just listening to a lesson, they're actively participating in the gameplay. And then they are uh, more likely to reinforce those concepts so that they grasp them longer than just looking at text, listening to a lesson, and then having to memorize that answer. And I obviously am biased because it's what I do and what I see, but I'm going to tell you from firsthand experience that games complement the classroom. Um, I know that every time that I go and and visit a school where our games are being used or an educational game by another vendor that's been designed specifically for learning, um, that you're gonna see some really great things happening. You're not just gonna see students sitting, staring at their screens. 
the gameplay really is supplemented by the teacher, by additional curriculum activities, and it's an incredibly social experience. Students oftentimes are talking as they're playing games and uh, showing each other how to solve complex problems. So, you know, this is not a situation where kids put in headphones and close off. This is actually a really great complement to the classroom. And lastly, games promote retention. I really believe and I've seen through uh, scores that Filament has put together in case studies that games provide that extra platform for our students to retain a lot of the complex information that they're studying. Um, studies, again, have shown this and uh, our games in particular come with curriculum that provides a sample assessment so that teachers can actually look and see scores that students have come up with and see that for themselves. So I've mentioned our program, but I'm going to show you in depth what it is and I'm going to talk to you a bit about the different components in detail. Hey Al, we got a question coming in from the chat. Sure. Um, so what are the strategies we can use as technologists and educators that understand the power of games and learning, but the connotation is difficult to sell to admins, boards, and other, and the education communities at large? It's a great I don't question. don't have an answer, but I think we still have a challenge. Absolutely. I actually, it's a good place on this slide to address that because we come across the same thing all the time when talking to administrators or talking to people who may not have used games before and seeing the benefit. I totally believe that um, the data that is collected through what I'll be talking to you about from the teacher and district dashboard and the reinforcement of professional development is the the best way to make an educated case for using games. So when I get a little bit deeper into the presentation, we'll talk about rollout options and implementation options, which are not a one size fits all, but may be a situation that is more beneficial when you're coming up against administrators or educators that are a little more unsure about the sell on games. I don't know if that completely answered it, but I think a little bit later in the presentation, it may answer that question. Yeah, we'll, let's revisit it at the end once we've gone through yeah. this, because we touched on that. So Absolutely. Really Jet, is it okay with you if we save questions until the end? Sure, no problem. However you want to do it. Keep them coming, guys. I would, I'm more than happy to answer questions. So the games library is the biggest component to the filament game-based learning program. Right now we have 14 math and science games. We have games that are queued up for the next couple of months. We'll be adding ELA, uh, some additional math content, and each of our games works on uh, desktop computers, laptops, because it's web-based. There are also iPad and Android apps for schools that might have devices if they're one-to-one. -one. And I mentioned earlier that each game comes with supplemental curriculum. This is really key. This is not a prescription that a teacher has to use when implementing games, but going back to that question that we just had, it's actually really nice to have a sample roadmap on how to implement a game into the classroom for educators who may not have done it before. So the curriculum integrates the gameplay and provides a really great way for educators to be able to kind of see where a game might fit into what they already might be teaching. The data, which I also mentioned, is so important. So we have a teacher dashboard that tracks in-game progress. So these are tasks that the students are completing, their learning objectives, and what that level or that specific task that they're manipulating is trying to teach. There's exposure to academic standards as all of our games are aligned to Common Core, Next Generation Science Standards, Benchmarks for Science Literacy, and it also will show, which I think personally is the most important areas or uh, ways in which a student can improve. So if a student is taking multiple times to complete a level, it's really important that the teacher says, hey, I noticed that student two right there seems to be falling behind when every other student seems to be going really quickly. And you don't just have to intervene then and say, hey, what's going on? You can actually hover over the task that they're not completing and see what specific learning objective 
that they're struggling with. So you can talk to that student and supply the correct intervention to try and make sure that they understand the subject matter. Here's another screenshot of the teacher dashboard, just a little bit closer up. You can see that at the top, we've got different learning objectives and standards that the students are being exposed to in each level. And you can also see just a general progression for each student right there on the left. Now, games in the classroom are great, but we also know that if we're talking about some kind of rollout in mass, that data on a district level is so important. So we designed a district level dashboard so that administrators, school building leaders, tech specialists, all of you can see exactly what is happening in real time with your teachers and students. So here's another screenshot of the district dashboard. You'll see data breaking down by school. You'll see the individual teachers that are using the product. You'll see the students. And you'll also be able to see some really cool things like what game is potentially the most popular and what subject area tends to be used the most through gameplay. You'll also be able to see when your play sessions are. Maybe you're getting most of your play sessions in school. Maybe you're actually seeing kids using the games outside of school, at home, or in after school programs. And this can help reinforce the, the decision of whether to add more games or to uh, set higher goals for what games can actually do for your district. The dashboards were designed carefully. So I'm gonna let Alex talk about how our dashboard design philosophy is unique. So yeah, Al asked me to talk a little bit about this because this is something that we've spent a lot of time over the years thinking about and iterating on. Um, dashboards or any sort of report or aggregation of data or visualization or anything you want to call it um, it's really important that um, you really keep the user in mind because I there's a bunch of way there's a bunch of data that you could collect or that we do collect from our games for the purpose of representing that for educators um, but there's a bunch of naive ways of representing that data that make it impossible to use effectively. Uh, and we've tried all those ways. So it's not like I'm not saying that we just did it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what we've learned is a couple things. One is you really need to focus the information. So yes, there's a bunch of things you could show. But what is essential for an educator to move in the classroom? They have a tablet, they have a laptop, or they're on their teacher computer in the classroom or in the lab. They see this dashboard, they've got students playing the games then. How do we make it actionable immediately? Well, progress information is actually the most essential because we don't know, our students get, are they getting, because in the game, a lot of, the game itself usually has scaffolding and also uh, a lot of built-in opportunities for uh, safe failure. That's kind of part of one of the reasons um, uh, pedagogically that games can be really effective in teaching certain subjects because it allows especially for iteration like engineering type problems any types of um, system problems um, you kind of have to it's not trial and error per se but there is a process that occurs where you're testing hypotheses and in the real world sometimes if testing hypotheses can cause a failure that's much more dramatic or dangerous than in the game um, so what the teachers go on to see is how are people testing hypotheses in the game and how they're progressing. Uh, and that's really why that progress is important. Someone's progressing really fast, that tells you something different than someone's progressing slowly or, prog or progressing in a different path because some of the games branch. Um, but it's important to know that we don't tell the teacher what is good and bad about that because there's different possibilities based upon the teacher's actual observations or information that they know about that student as they've worked with them that might inform how they interpret that data. So we just make it really simple to give the teacher lots of time to then, of interpretation time, because it's really easy to see what's there to see. Um, and we use what's called a task model, which is um, basically saying, well, the game has these specific mechanics and actions. Um, those are aligned to some specific outcomes and we're gonna report when those things line up. Um, but then it's up to the teacher to determine which ones they wanna pay attention to or ignore. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, and the nice thing about that task model too is that it applies to pretty much any type of interactive 
uh, at that point. So, so our challenge was how do we come up with a flexible system that applies to any type of interactive that we might deploy into our, our customers' schools, but that is so actionable. That's very difficult to do uh, without some a lot of thinking. So that's, that's what we've been thinking about. And we're still iterating even to this day. But Absolutely. We have, feel like we have at least something pretty useful to work with. Definitely. So I'm going to, again, hand this over to Alex because another component that we run up against when implementing in schools is the integrations and privacies uh, that schools really take seriously. And we're obviously talking to you today because you have an interest or are using Illini Cloud. And Illini Cloud is a platform that we are looking to integrate with. So Alex will talk to you a bit about both. Sure. Um, so there's sort of like three levels of integration that we think about when talking about how we deploy our game solution in to institutions. Um, so and not in any particular order in the slide. Um, so one is at the LMS level. Not every institution has a campus-wide or district-wide LMS. Um, some do. Uh, and then for ones that do, there's different levels of teacher adoption, right? So all those considerations, and, and you might be a different stages of your roadmap for deploying that. So all that comes into consideration about whether or not you choose if you were to do either a pilot or deployment of something like what we do or what um, or something like this that you want to consider. Um, and the way that the easiest way for tools like this to integrate in LMS is through basically an embed or iframe type solution. Um, and the IMS LTI specification really makes it straightforward to do that. And most learning management systems support an LTI version to varying degrees. Um, and then we have an IMS thin common cartridge kind of zip file we could send that makes it, you just kind of drop it into the LMS and then it's set up, um, which, which is kind of nice um, for each of our games. Now, um, that sort of, but doesn't totally solve the identity problem um, because, um, there, and there's two levels of this identity problem. There's like, there's actually, who are you and are you authorized to use this app? And then there's also like questions about, okay, well, what, how, who's your teacher? What section are you in? What school are you in? Which is this enrollment question. So for an identity, we support SAML and OpenID. SAML is just the solution that we would use in the Illini Cloud scenario where we integrate with their provider and then, for schools subscribe to Atlantic Cloud, then our app will absolutely appear on the portal and you launch them, students would launch them and it would be good to go. Um, and also have a like Google Class, you know, Google account integration, Google Classroom, that type of thing. Um, for enrollment, um, that's a little more complicated because there isn't one standard for enrollment data. And there actually, there are a couple of main standards for the actual data, but not that many standards for uh, that are, um, or not, that much widespread adoption of protocols for um, sharing that data uh, with applications. I think Atlantic actually does an excellent job of this because they use the Edify ODS. Um, we don't have an implementation yet that is in our roadmap. Um, our model sort of aligns with ODS pretty well. And we don't use that many fields for applications, really just section, uh, student enrollment and teacher enrollment. And then we have also a layer of administration, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there is some data that can be reported. Well, since the games are for, for use for formative assessment, not summative assessment, to the extent that you want to use that data back in um, your school information system, is obviously it's something that I'm interested in hearing about, but there's still something we're trying to think about. Uh, oh yeah, and there's privacy. Uh, you know, if we are a cloud-based solution, um, which means the data is not housed in the district data center, but we employ all the best practices and the same practices that your IT department deploys to secure your students' data. Um, and we also really don't need to share very much data, and we actually don't share any PII at all, or request any PII. So it's basically student's first name, last initial, and an identifier to associate them with a section. Um, and that's all that we store. Um, everything is encrypted, and uh, we obviously have all the record processing and 
other requirements that you need to be compliant with FERPA and the other um, just state specific regulations that you may have. So Alex, it sounds like because you've designed most of this as, as I'm just kind of going in and helping implement that the entire point of the solution is that it's turnkey. Uh, there's not a ton of responsibility on the school and districts end of things to mm -hmm. do a lot of data management. We try and make it really simple to just go in and allow teachers and administrators to roll this out. Mm -hmm. So now that you know how simple it is, you know the different components of the program, and you also know why you'd want to use games, I'm going to tell you how to get started. One thing that is so useful to administrators, teachers, there's really no person that I haven't seen find something useful is, in, is this guide that I'm, I took a screenshot of right here. The district implementation guide that Filament Games has made has lots of information on school and district success stories, lots of planning and funding resources, examples of ways that games have made a difference in different sized buildings. And this is a guide that we're going to walk you through a little bit today, but we're also supplying to you after this webinar. So I will follow up with Jat once this is done and Jat can send you this PDF. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can look at implementing. The first, obviously, is a district technology plan because the games primarily will be used on technology and devices. So there are a number of things that you need to consider when you're thinking about writing games in, and this is not hard. I have seen great examples of technology plans that are able to actually find ways to write games into their mission uh, they're able to identify key team members that will help roll out the games and set really awesome examples of goals that games can help their students achieve. There are also great things to consider in terms of technology resources and rollout options, and we can't forget curriculum because as much as we enjoy uh, trying out new technology and planning new ways to use it, curriculum is so important. And so we're going to dive in to the first bullet on this list, and that is mission. I have seen, as I mentioned before, some great ways that games have been included into a mission. Games obviously engage students. There is a really likely scenario that you're gonna see some high achievement with gameplay, and you're gonna get that, those data-driven results. Other than that, there's also a really big trend right now for career readiness and 21st century skills, and a lot of educational games can actually help cater to that if that's part of your mission. Games, as Alex mentioned earlier in the presentation, also provide a safe and secure setting for students to practice complex or in real life unsafe uh, problematic scenarios. So as I mentioned before, exploring the human body, I don't think students are going to be doing that physically within the classroom, but a game would be able to replicate it. And of course, games, as we mentioned earlier, are scaffolded. So they will actually meet students' individual needs. These are just some example mission statement ideas that you could use, but there are many more that you could come up with, and we're more than happy to help you brainstorm those if you have a unique challenge for the mission within your school or district. Team is also incredibly important, and I'll talk a little bit later about rollout options, but before you even consider rolling out, you're going to need a really great team to help you. I like to call them evangelists or stakeholders, and these evangelists don't discriminate by title. So you could choose your team by looking at which teachers you know would be really interested in their classrooms to testing things out. You could choose your team by choosing a specific school building or school that would like to try uh, rolling out the games and being responsible for testing to see if it works for you. I've also seen some really great ways that departments have worked together. So maybe your library program would work closely with your curriculum program and implement games within the library, but tie them into classes. And of course, you could also do special things like uh, if you have a STEM program, if you have before or after school or summer school programs, and those teams of people can come together to roll out this new initiative. Goals are also important too. 
And there are so many different things that games can help achieve when it comes to goals. So whether you're trying to grow your technology initiative or you're trying to make better use of some of the tools that you have in your curriculum, games, as we have mentioned, really can help supplement some of the things that you already have going on. So I've also made some example goals that you can see. One that I commonly see is under academic success curriculum and achievement. So if critical thinking is important and you also want students to demonstrate problem solving with your curriculum, games can be a great way to solve that goal. There is also another common uh, goal that I see, which is around real world applications and global citizenship. Again, games are a great way to allow students to try real world tasks and also uh, work with other students within their, their classroom and learn new things that they may not have access to within the, the confines of an actual physical classroom and goals can help solve that as well. And professional development is also a great goal to set and once again, games can not only help you uh, or help a teacher learn new skills in terms of supplementing the material they have, but games also can help with professional development around new devices if you are adding new technology to your district. So if you're going one-to-one, -one, you could potentially have teachers not just learn the device, but then also learn the device with an application on it, like a learning game or the curriculum, so that they can actually get practice with both. Technology resources, of course, is important too. So you really have to sit back and consider, do I have the resources to implement a game-based learning program? And the good news is with a product like Philema Games Learning Game Library, you can because it is web-based and even if you don't have access to high-end devices or you're not one-to-one, -one, it's going to work on a regular laptop, desktop. But we do, as I mentioned before, have app versions. So if you do have shiny new devices or you have uh, iPads and those Android tablets, games can be played on there and they also will sync right up to the dashboards that we talked about earlier. Now this is the big one and this is what I've kind of been leading up to this entire presentation because the big question is, this is great, Al. this sounds awesome, I'm sold, but how do I do it? And I have seen three distinct patterns of rollout options for a game-based learning program. So the first is a phased rollout. This is pretty common when you think that you maybe have a couple people that have bought in to the idea of games, but you really need to leverage the success of a smaller group to make the case for implementing games on a bigger scale. So maybe you start with one school, you start with your before or after school program, and you really document the usage, you document the good things that you're seeing, and then maybe you meet with your department or you meet with an administrator and you say, hey, these are the really great results we're seeing. We think every student in the district should have access to this really great product. We think that it would help them. Would you be interested in helping us scale? The other option that I see is a full implementation. And it's a little bit different than a phase rollout because you can look at it from a perspective of the district is making not only a recommendation on a product that they think is good, but they're also purchasing the product upfront for everyone. So there's actually a little bit of responsibility for the educators within the district to make use of the purchase. And this often happens in a district where there's a really great relationship between administrators and educators. So the educators don't feel like they're being handed something and just being forced to use it, but they trust the administrators actually would purchase great tools for them to use because that's what their job is. So if you feel that you have a great relationship with your educators or you trust your administration, a full implementation right up front might be a really great idea. And lastly, we definitely have people who say, both those options can't be on the table for us because we are a district that tests, tests, tests. And there's an option for that too. I always recommend a pilot for school districts that are a little bit on the fence about games but want to see that a difference can be made. I always recommend, however, that you're measuring for specific things during that pilot and you have a really confined amount of time for that pilot. So maybe it's a three-month pilot where you're testing it in 
all your science classrooms and you have a pre-test and a post-test and you want to make sure that your students actually gain something to be able to inform whether this is actually something you want to phase in or something you want to fully implement. So there's a variety of different ways that you can implement games into schools and districts. And regardless, you're not alone. You're more than welcome to reach out to us. That's what we do every day is we talk to teachers and administrators and we help them make this really easy, seamless task. I mentioned curriculum before, I'm gonna keep repeating it because games should never be standalone, particularly educational games. So when you're talking between tech and you're talking to the teachers, always include the curriculum directors, the subject department leads, because there's a number of things that they're gonna get excited about, particularly around assessment and reporting, and the fact that these games are aligned to specific standards, because it's their job to make sure that students are being taught things that are specific to the curriculum goals in the district. Because we have made that pretty simple for teachers on our website to see what students are learning in each game, what each game is aligned to. It should be pretty, a pretty easy conversation to include them in and say, hey, this is gonna solve multiple problems, not just technology problems, not just achievement problems, but curriculum problems too. And lastly, this is something that people don't consider, which surprises me a little bit, but I'm sure that you all will. Uh, internet bandwidth is a really tricky thing. We are in Madison, Wisconsin, so we know in the Midwest there's a lot of rural areas, and internet bandwidth can actually be a little bit tricky because there are some places still here in Wisconsin and Illinois where there still isn't access to great internet. So our games are pretty low bandwidth, and they sync up every so often to transfer data, so you don't need some kind of high-end connection um, that's gonna really draw on the classroom and maybe take away from other classrooms. So with our solution, you can know that even if you don't have access to the best internet, you're still gonna be able to play our games. You need those access to devices, like I mentioned before, and if you do have that LMS or single sign-on uh, solution that you are using, like Alex talked about earlier, that's something that we can play with here at Filament to help you achieve those goals and those integrations. So all you have to do is reach out and ask. And lastly, I think this is really the most fun is these games are not tied to your school. So you can send students home with a note to parents and say, hey, this is their login information. If you have a computer or you have a tablet at home, just log in with these credentials and students can actually continue their learning and play at home. Professional development is really the bow on top of everything here because that's really the way that you're going to get everyone to buy in, not just saying, hey, this, I think this is great, showing them. And at Filament, we offer three really great professional development courses that are fun and they are light and they are not heads down grinding to try and figure things out. So we do a game-based learning one-on-one course which teaches um, an introduction to using games within the classroom and diving a little bit deeper than we did in the presentation today about what makes a good game and why you should use them. And then we all know right now that game design and game development and coding in general is a really hot topic in K-12 schools right now. And because we are a Midwestern game developer, it's really easy and fun for us to cater that to your schools. So we do teach two courses on game design and game development that will teach teachers how to design and develop their own games. And then they can go back into their classrooms and teach students those concepts as well. And I could not skip over the most unfun part of the presentation, which is talk talking about budgets and funding. That's one of the top questions that I get is how can I afford this? Particularly because we know, at least in Wisconsin, that budget cuts are quite common and I'm sure that you're used to them as well. However, I have come up with some really creative solutions with a number of the administrators and teachers that I work with and these are my recommendations to you for helping get this rolled out on a larger scale. So if you're looking at your yearly budget and you're looking and you're like, oh, I absolutely could not afford access for all my students in this school or these schools, 
think of it not just as your department making an investment, think of it as multiple departments making an investment. So maybe curriculum is gonna go in on this with you, or there's a particular science department purchase because they need some tools, or maybe the library. There are so many different ways that departments can all make use of a games purchase. So it doesn't necessarily have to burden just one department. Grants and alternate forms of funding are also incredibly common, particularly if you have a really great relationship with parents or the community that you serve. Um, and so maybe it's worth asking if this is something that the community would want to invest in, particularly local businesses that might be looking for graduates, high school graduates, college graduates in your area to learn coding, to learn design theory. And I've seen it happen that way as well. And of course, you have to consider long-term or short-term cost to your district. One thing that's really special about Filament Games Game-Based Learning Program is that we are not subscription. We're a one-time purchase for our games, just kind of like an app store purchase almost, if that's the, that's the closest way I could describe it. So you're actually going to be purchasing not only a discount for your school and districts, but it's gonna get cheaper every year you use the product moving forward because you're going to be adding more students that can access those products. You're not gonna be reoccurring those charges every year, which can be really difficult when your budget shifts rapidly year to year. So if you are considering using games, try and consider whether you're going with a, a game solution that is subscription or a game solution that is one-time purchase. And I'm also going to give you just a few quick tips. I'm going to tell you real quick that um, there is no one size fits all. I know I mentioned three rollout plans. I mentioned some example goals, but every single school district and even classroom is different and is going to have different needs. So if you get stuck, reach out. We're more than happy to help. And I also can't emphasize enough that you need to set those goals and milestones when rolling out this program. So whether you're crossing your standards to game content, you're identifying your funding, you're introducing professional development, make sure that you have an objective in mind and that you're documenting it. These are all things that are mentioned in the district implementation guide that I talked about. And we even supply you with some worksheets that will help you write this out as a team and figure out exactly what will work best for your needs. As I mentioned, there's a little screenshot of the worksheet, and I'm, I, I cannot emphasize enough. Reach out, let us know if you need help, because you know that question really stuck with me. It sticks with me every time. How do I get buy-in? And the best way to get buy-in is making it a thing by documenting it, getting people together, and starting to show results. I'm going to leave you with two different districts that I've worked with that really came out two different ways, but still had some things in common. So in Wisconsin, I have two districts that are actively using our games. They are maybe a 10 minute drive apart. They're about the same size, but they, I guess I assume that they would be similar in terms of their needs because they're so close. The administrators all know each other, but it couldn't be more different. So District A did a full implementation. They had ready funds that they needed to use up. And they also had some devices that they had just implemented and they really wanted to make great use of them. And a full implementation was so useful to their situation. Whereas in District B, they decided to go with a phased rollout. The administrators really wanted to put a focus on whether the educators were really interested and ready to use games. And they also had a big goal around content alignment and making sure that all the tools that they were actively using in the district made sense in terms of what the teachers were actually teaching. But there was three things that they had in common. The first was professional development was the first thing they did in every situation to make sure that the teachers and the students felt really excited to start using games. They also made a purchase. So District A did a full implementation purchase, whereas District B made an initial purchase and tested it with a smaller subset of teachers and then grew it into a larger purchase when they felt that they had the educators that were ready. And of course, they both had a custom implementation. So they didn't look at it as a one size fits all. And instead, they, they let us know what their needs were and we found a really creative and unique way to make sure that it fit. 
I mentioned before, you're going to get a copy of the district implementation guide. We also have uh, an ebook that was created this year on how to teach with games and some really exciting examples of how teachers are using games in their classrooms. And it would be no fun listening to this entire webinar if you actually didn't get to play some of the games that we offer. So I'll make sure that I give you free games access that you can try yourself, you can test out on some students, you can pass around to teachers. And of course, you're more than welcome to reach out and schedule a consultation with me and we can talk about how we can get this started for your district. So let's talk about questions. I'm gonna pull up my chat. Okay, uh, while you're doing that, I can read off the first one. So how can people register or gain access to the PD that you're talking about around gaming? That is something you schedule directly with me. So Jad, I will follow up with you with this after this presentation with all the different things that uh, um, I mentioned in the slides and then also my email so that people can get something scheduled to talk. Okay, and I'm, uh, for the group, I'm going to have put my uh, email information into the chat so people can use that to reach out to me and I can help facilitate any conversations or dialogue. Correction, correct my email here. Uh, next question, are you guys going to be at Brainstorm or any other regional events? We just turned on Brainstorm, unfortunately. We just didn't think that we had the best content to deliver for that group of people. However, we will be at Slate this year in the Dells um, in Wisconsin. We'll have an actual gaming corner and um, some area and a space for you to be able to play our games and talk to our team about how they were made and how you can get them in your schools. And we'll actually be presenting as well with Sun Prairie School District in Wisconsin, which is actually the district I mentioned before that went full implementation and some of the really great success they've seen, not only from the program, but also um, the initiative to have students start designing their own games. And Jim, I see that you're interested about learning more with Slate. Slate is a regional Midwest ed tech conference. I can absolutely send Jet more information. Great. Other questions? We've got about 10 minutes left, but if uh, there are no other questions, we can end a little bit early. But let me pause. All right, we have another question. Can you share a list of your games and the content? Yes. The list will be at filamentlearning.com and that will be provided after this webinar with access to each of those titles. Right now, out of those 14, most of them, a majority are science, but we do have two math games, one for elementary, one that's a little bit more focused towards middle school. And I can't provide access right now, but we have some really great new math content and ELA content within the next month or so. Great. Other questions? Hey, Jad, I just wanted to add, um, Filament Games is uh, leading, uh, the, they're the opening act for a series of games and learning uh, webinars going forward. Uh, Ed Gamers coming up, obviously, you guys, uh, Filament Games know those folks well. A lot of the people we uh, met through the GLS, the Games and Learning Society, um, and all the great work that University of Wisconsin does, MIT does, and um, uh, these, it's a big movement and we're trying to be able to uh, make this really more important for education because we know it's, it can be successful. So there's a lot of aspects to this and um, we're hoping that uh, Filling Games can come back later too because they've been a great partner working with all these project spaces that are kind of really hard to get, you know, we really want to get them in, in schools because we know they can benefit kids. And Jim is one of our favorite districts that we work with, Bloomington and Normal. District 87 and Unit 5 are both really great districts that are doing some really cool things. And now them. also the lab schools at yeah. University, which is really good too. So that's great. But I just want to make sure that um, we keep connected with you guys because you're doing really good stuff. You're very aware of the, uh, the marketplace and where these uh, things are changing out. And we really appreciate your time. Hopefully you can come back. Sounds good. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Elle and, and Alex. I, I found this webinar to be very uh, insightful and uh, time well spent. So great job. And thank you again for, uh, for the opportunity. No, thank yeah. you.
We'll be in touch, Jet. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.